Let's go before the Lord. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you give to us, Lord, and the very faith that you pour into us. God, we just pray that you'll be with us today. Open our hearts and minds to you. Open our lives to you, Father. And make the entranceway just so awesomely broad as we enter into the very kingdom of you and your throne and all that's of you, Father. Thank you for allowing us this day to, dep- to participate in your divine glory and to come away from it changed. We love you and we worship you. Come, open our hearts and minds, Father. Come, come, teach us. We ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit right now upon your word and upon every ear that will hear this, Lord. Again, that you administer directly to them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. I'm in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 8 through 17. I've entitled today's sermon, Faith unto Faith. Faith unto Faith. Please stand if you're able for the reading of the word. Romans 1, 8 through 17, New American Standard Bible. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness how to unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers making requests, and for perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation, both to Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Listen, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Please be seated. What more can any of us ever hope for than to be saved, called of God, and set apart for the gospel? You look at each one of those things, our salvation, the calling of God upon our lives, and then set apart for the gospel and for the reason that the Lord has laid hold of you for. To be drawn into his presence, into the things of God. There's no greater gift that God can give to you as as a man or a woman. There's a reason you've been born again. There's a distinct purpose. God has called you into fellowship with Him, His Son, and His Spirit. There's a distinct reason why. Whatever God has truly put in to your heart to do, it will always, it will always be about the gospel and promoting the message. The power derived from it and the righteousness imparted by God to us who believe. We must what? Believe. We have to believe. In every aspect, it is faith onto faith. I love it. In that aspect, you think about it. You can't go anywhere in anyone Christian's heart and mind apart from faith being imparted to them by someone. You have to receive faith by participating in what? In the faith of another. How does that work for Paul, Chuck? Well, I got to tell you, when when Paul was persecuting the church, you think that there were a bunch of saints and they just cowered in a room somewhere and that they they weren't concerned for all the other Christians in their life that were being prosecuted and persecuted by him? Oh, no, no, no. That's not what was going on. I'll tell you what was going on. Fervent prayer. Fervent prayer for him was going on. They were praying for him and the people that he was what? Persecuting. You know what they're asking God for? Do something. They're asking the Lord to do something. Did he show up? And so when when Jesus appears to Paul, all of a sudden, you know what? What did it make him? Oh, I promise you, he was in absolute belief. (laughs) He was in belief. 
He was in faith. That whole time in his life, he thought he was serving who? He literally thought he was serving God by doing all these wrong things. He was literally killing people, which is absolutely against what? The very law that he seemed to be what? Promoting. And yet in that moment, Jesus showed up. And what did he impart to him? Oh, who are you, Lord? Who are you that I'm persecuted? He said, I am Jesus. And immediately he realized that he was no longer in what? I'm not in control. This whole time I've been serving something I, I thought was the right thing and found out what? That I wasn't. You think that made him happy? I believe Paul delved into a deep, 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 deep remorse and depression in his life. Literally blinded. Blinded, literally. Realizing that the blindness truly went to the core of who he was, of who he was, who he wasn't. And what he really, really, quite frankly, listen, really wanted to be. He really wanted to be serving God with all what? His heart and his soul. And Jesus saw that. In every aspect, faith onto faith. What does that mean, Chuck? Faith onto faith. It's the mutual sharing of one's faith to another who needs it. That's what it is. Listen closely, saying to God, there's nothing you can obtain from God except by faith. Nothing. The very grace of God is attained by faith. Once you've acquired it, by God giving it to you, whatever it may be, the giving and sharing will always be in faith. And in the hope that the other will obtain just that. What? Faith. And share in the very gift, grace, and salvation which you have received. That's how it works. Faith on the faith. If you can mark your life back, all the way back, if you were to mark your faith all the way back to the point that you got born again and walk it back and think about everyone who was involved in participating in faith that marched all the way down to who? You. You know, you know where you would ultimately end, right? Jesus. That's where you would end. Because whoever shared faith with the person who led you to the Lord, they also had someone in their life that what? Shared faith. Who is that? You go back four generations. Now you don't even know. Look, you, you probably can't even remember who your great, 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 great grandfather was. Can you? Can you? Do you even know who it was? If you do, I, I commend you. Most people, you can go back about three generations and that's about it. You can remember back that far. But I, I've said this before and I mean it with all my heart. I mean it with all my heart. I'm longing for the day that I get home and I can go back to that chain. And each person in that chain that led me to Christ and to thank every last one of them. To thank them. Why? Because each one of them shared their faith. And each one of them, as a product of sharing their faith with someone else, led them to who? The Lord. The more you think about it, the more you come to realize everything of God is filled with this faith. Everything that's of God is filled with this faith. It's filled with this hope. It's filled with His love. It's filled with His truth. It's filled with His Spirit. Everything that's of God is done so. Just as He imparts those qualities to you, so you impart those qualities to others. I find that so amazing because it lined up perfectly with what Wayne and I were talking about this morning. When you go dive in the pool of His divine, His divinity, He imparts those qualities. Whatever you dive into and get a hold of, it gets a hold of who? You. It becomes a part of you. And you get to participate in everything that's of him. His faith, his hope, his love, his truth, and his spirit. And just as he imparts those qualities to you, you get the ability to impart those qualities to others. You are simply sharing, listen, exactly what God has given to you. I hear that in Paul. I hear that. Look, he, he wants to go to Rome. Why? That not only can he share faith with them, and share the things of God with them, but he's also looking forward to what? Them mutually sharing with him. He also needs to be encouraged. Oh, how wonderful to know God shares himself with us. Listen, and all that's of them. You, you, you believe that, right? You know that, right? You, you're not serving a God who's trying to hide his divinity from you. You're, you're not serving a God who doesn't want a personal relationship with you. There's a lot of Christians out there who believe that God is so far away that they can never participate with them. And I'm here to tell you it's a lie. That's not the truth. 
The truth is the complete opposite of that. He wants to participate with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to share life with you and everything that's of him. Look, and he's sharing himself with you. You get to participate in it. As you look into the word and into his word, and you look into the life of God and all that he's put into Paul, you can clearly, you can clearly see the replication of it. He, look, he, he invests what? Life into him. He's motivated, right? He, he, he's invested his word into Paul. He's invested all these things. That he's, listen, he's literally invested himself into him. He's invested his spirit in him and given him a broad knowledge of everything that's truly of him. And what does Paul want to do with it? Just hide it and keep it away from everyone? No, you hear it in his words. He, he wants to preach the word wherever he can, whether it be to Greeks, whether it be to barbarians. <laughs> Whoever it might be, and now what? He wants, he's got this longing to go literally to Rome and to preach to the Romans and to teach them, but always with a mutual respect, always with a mutual desire. To what? Do you think Paul's still not learning? Do you, do you still think that he doesn't need encouragement in his life and growth? He needs it. So he, he understands how it's a mutual thing. Look, it's not just enough. For me to be in the pool. I said it this morning. I'm saying it again. I want everybody else to what? Come play the pool. We were talking about it. It's like, it's like kids, at, it's like kids at, at, at a playground. And you, you see two or three that are out there having a great time. What are they enjoying? You see them on what? The monkey bars? What else do they play on? The seesaws? What else? What's the thing that goes around? The merry-go-round? Right? And, and you got five other kids sitting on the sideline. And we're all out there wondering... They're like, man, that looks like so much fun. Looks like so much fun to go out there. I wonder what that's like. And, and the other kids are like, what? Come on out. Try it out for yourself. You can see me having fun with it. Oh, I want that for you. That's what I feel like in regards to God's word. It's like, yeah, I want to go and play on it. But you know what? I want you to come hang out with me in the playground. Come get in the pool with me. That's what I want. Why? You know who's there, right? You realize who's there. You know who's making it so much fun and such a joy. Who is it, Terry? God. Yeah. Who, who, you think he's not on the playground? You think he's not out there? You think he's not in it? He wants you to come participate with who? With him. I see it in Paul. So what is faith, Chuck? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about sharing it, right? What is faith? Well, let's break it down. Let's break faith down so we know exactly, exactly what we're talking about here. Hebrews 11.1 1 is the best definition for faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What is that? Well, faith is the assurance, it's the substance of things that I'm hoping for. Well, what are you hoping for? What are you hoping for? Look, Abraham was hoping for something when he took his son Isaac up on the hill to sacrifice him. What was he hoping for? Well, I'll tell you that God would raise him from the dead. That's what he was hoping for. And in a sense, that's what exactly what happened. See, that's faith. The substance of what he was, he had a favorable, confident expectation that even though he took his son up on the hill to sacrifice him, that he was going to receive it. He says it in the words and everything. When he tells the servants, hey, you guys stay here and me and my son are going to worship God over there. And then we're both coming back to you. That's a statement of faith. That is an absolute confidence what is that? With a favorable, confident expectation. What is that? It's hope. It's hope. So I have something to hold on to. I have assurance. I have the substance of things that I am and have a favorable, confident expectation that I'm going to receive. Because that's what hope is. It's not, I think so. It's say it again. I know without any doubt. That's a favorable confident expectation. I have an expectation of what I'm going to receive. Evidence? Evidence is the assurance. It's the conviction. It's the reproof of that which I cannot see. So it always leads me to those things that I have not yet obtained or that I know, I know that's there and yet I haven't got it all yet. Does that make sense? Like what, Chuck? I'm longing for heaven, aren't you? I'm longing for all those that are there. I'm longing for God who's there. I'm longing for a relationship with him there. I know that he's got a home for me there. Absolute perfection is going to be there, but I haven't fully obtained it all yet. Have you? 
But by faith, I know that it's what? I have no doubt in my heart that it's there. I have no doubt in my heart that the people I love and care about and those that are right with Jesus, guess where they're at? They're there. And you know, they're, they're not just standing by up there. I got to tell you, they're cheering us on. They're cheering us on. There, there's an entire multitude of people, the entire witness of God, the entire, what, what do they call it in the Bible? What is it called? The host of heaven. The entire host of heaven. All of it is, you know what? There are witnesses watching us even right now. You know what they want for us? The very thing that I'm preaching on today. Faith. Belief. Participating in the divine nature. What is it like to be in the very presence of God to do so, to be in fellowship with him? And I'll say it with one another. That's what he wants for us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It proves that it's there. Give me an example, Chuck. Okay, I got one for you right now. Listen, right now I'm exercising faith. Right now. How is that? The substance and assurance I have with an absolute confident expectation is that the very word that I'm sharing with you will fill you and feed you spiritually and impart to you the very core of who you are, what God would say to you. I believe with all my heart that he's doing that right now, whether here or there or wherever you happen to be later on today, whenever people will view this sermon, I know that God's going to speak to them. I know that without any doubt in my heart. I cannot see that physically right now, but I know without any doubt he has spoken to you or will be speaking to you because he's spoken to me. And I'm simply sharing with you what he's put in my heart to share with you. The faith he has given me, I now give to you. Listen, I'm sharing with you what he has shared with me of himself. And I simply want you to share in that. Does that make sense? Every born, Christian, born again Christian should be of the same mindset in their life on a daily basis. With everyone who's in your life. Listen to Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11. Without faith. Listen. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. It's impossible to please God. Without. You've got to have faith. You'll never be able to please God apart from having faith. It is the core necessity in all that is of him. Why would you ever come to him apart from believing in him? Why? You wouldn't. You wouldn't. That's the answer. You, you would never come to God if you didn't believe in him. You cannot even approach him apart from believing in him. And that requires faith. You, what are you doing in your mind when you, when you think you're going before God and you don't really believe in him? Who are you really going before? You, you ain't. You're not going before God. You're not approaching him. You're not. Because you have to believe that he exists. You have to believe it. You have to believe with all your heart. In fact, faith has to be realized in you. In what? Well, it's no longer faith. You know, you know the ultimate in faith? You know, what, you know what happens with ultimate faith? It becomes reality. It becomes reality. You, you want to talk about faith? How about, how about the guy who's sitting on the sideline... Son of man, son of man, have mercy on me. And they, everybody tells him to what? Shut up. Literally, that's what they're saying to him. He's shut up. And you know what he does? Son of man, have mercy on me. And they say, will you be quiet? And the Lord says what? Who is that guy? I'm, bring him to me. <laughs> that, guy, that guy has what? And what's he want? What do you want? What is it do you want? What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I, I want to see. I, I want to see. See? Your faith is, what, what does he say? Your faith. Your faith has made you well. Your faith. Believing. Look. If you look throughout the Bible, how many times does Jesus turn to people who are in absolute what? Faith, believing, believing in him and what heals them. Jesus says it's their faith. Your faith has what? Your faith has healed you. Your faith. Your faith. You cannot even approach him apart from believing in him. And that requires faith. 
You'll never hear him. You're never going to hear the Lord apart from faith. You have to believe him. Faith realized becomes reality. And each one of those individuals, when they actually believed, what became reality? As a product of their faith. Faith realized is just that. It's no longer I think so. It's what? I know so. I'm healed. And I'm going to say it. Do you ever see him going back for a second one? Do you ever see him going back? Oh, Jesus, you healed me of my blindness a week ago, but it came back. Do you ever see that happen in the Bible? Somebody has leprosy and they're cured. Do you, you ever see them going back for a second healing? The answer is what? No. I want the real thing, don't you? I want real healing. Real healing. And those who would tell you that that doesn't exist, they're lying to you too. Genuine healing is there for you. Externally, internally, whatever it is that you need, God can heal you, will heal you. And when he does, you're never going to have to go back for another one. Amen? You're going to get it. Through faith, you obtain a good testimony. How do you know that? Hebrews 11, 2. Look, for by it, what? Faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. I want you to take the time today after you read 2 Peter chapter 1, then cruise on over to Hebrews chapter what? 11 and read through that. And look at the hallmark of faith and watch what people do. Even though they haven't received it yet, look at the things that people do and their actions and their words and what they believe in their hearts as they exercise their what? Their faith. And you know what they do? They obtain a testimony. What's a testimony? Martyr. The Greek word is martorio. It's literally what? It's a sacrifice. Martorio. It means what? It's a testimony. We get our English word what from? Martyr. You're a martyr. You literally have something that God has done for you and answered your what? Prayers. Answered your requests. Whatever it is. He's changed your life. He's entered into that situation. And when he does and he brings like the healing. Remember the guy? Remember the guy who was in the Solomon's colonnade? Remember that? It was at Bethsaida. And, and Jesus heals him. And he, he doesn't. Nobody will help him. He doesn't even know who did it. He doesn't know. And all of a sudden, what's he doing? All of a sudden, they don't believe that he was healed. All of a sudden, they don't believe that he was a paralytic completely and couldn't even get into the water. Remember this? And, the, and, the, and what happens? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they keep questioning about him and keep questioning him about him. And he says to them, I've told you. And you don't believe it. <laughs> Do you want to become his disciple too? <laughs> Immediately, what? What's he doing? He, look, he's sharing. Look. That guy is sharing his testimony. He's sharing with what? Exactly what Jesus did for him and how he was what? Healed. There is a tendency within the Christian body that when you come out of your sinful life, that somehow or another you've forgotten what you've been purified from. And the intent is not for you to do so. The intent for you is not, is not to forget where you came from, Terry. It's to remember where you came from in the hope that you will have the ability to what? Share with something, someone else who's going through the same struggle that you have what you've come out of as a product of God entering in through your faith and belief and healing you and changing your life. That's the intent. That's the intent. Through faith, you obtain a good testimony. I love the Greek in here because you really don't capture the full expression of that word in the Greek. Because it, it's a combined term. I really struggled with this when I was going through studying this. Because you literally had martyr. But then there was another word that was co co contained with it in my Greek text. In my uh, New King James Version. In my, uh, my expository, uh, my, my Bible that I have. It's a Greek interlinear. And there was two words there and I'm struggling through that. And the more I looked at it, I realized that the other word that was there was the sorrows. So you have martyria, which is what? Witness. And a thesaurus. You know what a thesaurus is? It's a book. You know what, you know what, you know what thesaurus actually means? Treasure. So when you, look, when you go on, do you realize that? That when you, you look in a thesaurus and a thesaurus is what? It's just basically every word that anybody could ever come up with, right? Do you realize you're diving into treasure? And in this case, we're not talking about man's word. We're talking about whose word? God's. Combine, listen, do you realize how much treasure there is in your personal testimony? The treasure of your testimony. A good testimony. A treasured testimony. You have a treasured testimony. 
God has entered into your life and changed it in whatever shape, form, or manner that is. Whatever he's led you out of, however you got born again, that's absolute what? Treasure. And for you to share that with someone else, what are you sharing with them? The treasure. The treasure of what God has done for you. You're sharing literally what? Your testimony? Uh-huh. Your faith in what God has done for you. Take the time. Take the time and taste of the treasure of another's treasure testimony in Hebrews 11 today, would you? Any gospel that you choose, even there you're going to find it. And for that matter, any, any book of the Bible, they're absolutely filled with the treasures of those who have received from the Lord by faith and how it changed their lives. In a sense, you, you participate in their faith every time you read it. Did you know that? Every time I come to the Word of God and I open it up and I, I, see, I see how God has affected someone else's life. In this case, I was in the book of Romans and I'm, I'm going through chapter 1 in that thing. And all of a sudden I'm seeing the impact that Christ has had upon Paul. How the faith that God has poured into him through his son, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And those who shared the God, Ananias comes up and shares with him and tells him exactly what's going to happen. And, and all of a sudden all that pours into Paul and all of a sudden this changes his life life for how long forever and now it's not enough for Paul to be changed because now he wants to do with what with it he's not going to hold it in you know what he's going to do with it he's going to share it he was going to preach it he's going to teach it to anybody who listens even those who won't listen he's still going to what he's still going to share it they're stoning you today Paul get me back up I'm going back in the city wow that's faith Knowing that God's got your life in his hands. Take the time. Read through it. You participate in their faith every time you read it. Even the faith of Christ. You get to participate in it. Listen, and by so doing, you acquire more. Every time you participate in hearing another's testimony, you know what, you know what God builds in your heart? More and more what? Belief in him? Absolutely. Faith in him? Absolutely. Trust in him? Yep. Yep. Hope, yep, love, yep, joy, peace, whatever it might be. How do you know? Romans 10, 13 through 17. New American Standard Bible. For whoever will call in the name of the Lord will be what? Well, how? Why would they ever call in the name of the Lord? Why would they do that? Oh, verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Why would they ever call on somebody they don't believe in? Well, they wouldn't. And how will they believe in him in whom they've not heard? Uh, have they heard about Jesus? Have they heard about what God can do? Have they heard about what Christ has done on the cross? Have they heard about that? And how will they hear without a preacher? How in the world is anybody in the world going to hear about Christ without someone going and telling them? That's what a preacher is. Amen. How will they preach unless they are what? Sent. Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And that's the intent of you and your ability to share your faith into this world, right? With anybody and everyone who wants, to, who wants to hear. And even those who won't. What? You're simply sharing the good things that God has done for who? For you. Verse 16. However, they did not all heed the good news. Oh, I love Wayne. You know what he would say here? Qualifier. That's what he would say. Qualifier. It's qualified. What, what, however, they did not all heed the good news. Oh, so you can hear good news and then not do anything with it? Uh-huh. Yep, you certainly can. You, you can hear the good news right now. You can hear the gospel. You can hear the fact that you can be born again. You can hear the fact that you can change permanently. You can hear the fact that God can heal you permanently. You can hear all that, but not even what? Take heed to it. What's it mean to take heed to something? To hear it and then to what? Do it. What, in this case, what? Here, believe. Believe. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Here's the key. Here comes right back to this. Faith on to faith. Listen. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You want to get a hold of faith? I, I, this tells me clearly, if you don't believe anything else I said, at least you can believe this and say, do you want real faith? Then simply go read 
the words of Jesus Christ. Now, you have plenty of Bibles out there that are called red letter editions. And those red letter editions, all you can see is red. whenever you see the red in the Bible, you know what those are? Those are the words of Jesus. So you want to get a hold of faith? Well, stay in the red letters. Stay in the red letters. That'll grant you faith. Amen? Joe Cole, he imparted the faith of God that God gave to him to give to me. And by so, so doing, Joe, Joe led me to faith and belief in God. He did. I, I, I'll never forget that day. I, I'll never forget it. Wayne and I were, we were discussing a little bit this morning. I'll never forget that day when I finally decided I, I wanted to go to church. Not, not, not being made to go by my mom and dad. Not, not being made to go. But, but I wanted to go. He had witnessed to me enough and shared what God had done in his life. And he had shared enough of his faith in me that I saw something in him that I, I wanted. I, I didn't realize it was Christ. But it was Christ who was making his appeal through Joe to me. And I'll never forget the day, the very first time I ever walked into the Christian Life Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, by the way, my, my future wife was right across the street and I didn't even know it. Literally, literally, across the highway, right to the next street, across the highway, and Julie's house was right there, off to the right. I'll never forget that. But here's the point. As I went to walk into that church, literally, literally, as I'm walking into that church, a voice inside of me, and it's not the Lord, says, don't go in there. And it was that deep and that nasty. Don't go in there. That's all I remember hearing. And, and I, I went to step up on that thing, and literally something stopped me, and I, I took a step back. It, it, it scared me. And Joe turned around and me. You know what he did? He literally grabbed me by my hand. He, he grabbed me in an Indian handshake, if you know what that is, right? Where you, you grab another guy's hand. He grabbed me by the arm like that. And look, I'll never forget this. He looked me in the eye, and he looked at me. You know what he said to me? Chuck... Just try it once. Just try it once. If you don't like it, you don't ever have to what? You don't ever have to come back. And all of a sudden, something washed over me. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. We walked into that church, and of course, I'm used to, I'm just telling you, my background, I'm, I'm, I grew up a diehard Catholic. I grew up a Catholic. And when you went into church, there were two things you did not do. You didn't talk in church, and you sat there as a kid. I'm just telling you what happened for me, okay? I, I, I know things have probably changed a little bit, but I'm just telling you. You sat, and you did not say a word. And whenever they were, you to, were told to do something, you did it. And if you didn't, you were in trouble. Because my grandmother, my grandfather would give me the eye, and that's all I needed. My mother would be on me, right? And, and so I, I walk into this church, and I'm telling, I'm, Mr. P, I'm telling you, I've never seen so many happy people in all my life. And they were all smiling. I had people coming up, shaking my hand and hugging me. And I'm like, what in the world have I got myself into? Because I had this thought that I was going to come into this church and I was going to sit on the edge. So that when it was done, you know what I could do? Escape! Escape. <laughs> I could get out! You, yeah. They, look, that church was so packed, there was only two seats that were open. You know where they were at? Right down front. Not in front, in the middle. In the middle of the whole church, and I'm, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about, a, there, there had to have been 300 people in this church, okay? And they're all praising God, and they're all worshiping God. And I've, I've never seen anything like this before. And you know what I do? I sit down. I sit down. And I'll never forget this, because the music is gone, and people are praising and worshiping God. And Joe just simply turns to me, and he looks at me, and he goes, Chuck, I'm going to worship God now. I'm like, okay, Joe, you go ahead. And I just sat there. And after a while, they were having so much fun. You know what? I, I, didn't, I didn't know what we were doing, but I, I just wanted to be a part now. And I started worshiping God. And I went once, and I went twice, and I went three times, and all of a sudden it became a what? An addiction. And I, it wasn't because I had to go to church. It was because I wanted to be there. I, I, I never had people tell me that they loved me before like that. And they didn't even know me. And, and I could look in their eyes, and they meant it. And they meant it. It changed my life. God changed my life. 
through a man who was willing to share his faith with me. When all, I gotta tell you this with all the other men on my flight. I'll never forget this, I would be on my post because I was trapped <laughs> on a gate. There's nowhere to go, you can't leave post, okay, as a cop, you cannot leave your post in the United States Air Force, you go to jail for stuff like that. So I'm stuck, and I have four or five guys up on my post, and Joe Cole comes pulling up in the car, and he gets out, and you know what happens? And they scatter like roaches. <laughs> I never seen people flee like that. Oh, here comes Cole. I'm out of here. I'm gone. I was like, you guys are leaving. Like, yeah, yeah. All he's going to do is talk about Jesus. I know it's coming. I'm leaving. I'm gone. And so here I am. Joe would come up, and I'm, I'm like, I don't know what your problem is. I kind of enjoy what he says. I'm liking it. You know what? If I'm going to be honest, I'm longing for it. I can't wait to get on post. Cole's going to come up and share more with me about God. And I want it. Something inside of you, I see, I want, I need. You know what it was? It's Jesus. And faith and belief in him, amen? What will that do to you? <laughs> Look at me now. Oh, if I had told you on that, on back in those days that I'd be up here preaching to you and sharing Christ with you and preaching to telephone poles or trees or whatever else I could share Jesus with, I would have told you were, you had lost your mind. You had lost your mind. But that was God's plan and design for me. And I wonder, church, as you think about your life, what has God laid hold of you for? What is he trying to lay hold of you for? He's got a purpose and a reason for you, just like he did Paul. The faith of God replicates itself to everyone who believes. Therefore, in all reality... It's God who's sharing with you. It's the Lord who's sharing with you. Listen to Paul's desire. It's the same scripture, Chuck, I know, but I hope your spiritual tuners are open now to listen. Listen to what he's trying to say. Listen to the faith he's trying to share. Listen to what he's longing for from the Romans. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of the Son is my witness as how to unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers make a request if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you, among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to who? God, both the Greeks and the barbarians, because of my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm in obligation to them, both to the wise and to the foolish and anybody else who will listen. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who what? Who believes. For in, in it, what? In the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed from faith on to faith. Faith on to faith. It's never a one-sided relationship. Paul recognizes that even as he encourages and preaches, he also is in need of others to share with Verse 12 and 17 says, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each by other's faith, both yours and mine. And for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to what? Faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Yo, saying to God, live by faith and then share it. And also receive it from others who mutually live by faith. Everyone needs encouragement. There's no greater encouragement I can give you today than the words you read and hear at this very moment. In fact, I would say this. May the Lord himself fill you to overflowing as you jump in the pool. <laughs> Even as the heart of Paul overflows to the believers in Rome. Jump in the pool. Jump in. Go get wet and let it change your life. Amen? Come participate in it. Let it affect you and change you. You'll live by faith. I looked at that. I had to wonder, where did that come from? And, of course, the Bible told us it's right here. Say that one. 
Habakkuk, okay. New American Standard Bible. I stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. I see this as somebody who's absolutely what? Dedicated. They've been given a they've been given a, a an order and they're never gonna leave it. Listen, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Talking about who? The Lord. And in that moment, then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal. It will not fail. You know what that tells me? The word of God will become what? Reality. It's coming. Look, what's one of the promises we're still longing for? Jesus' return. It hastens towards its goal. And it will not fail because God has said so. For it will certainly come and it will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right with me. But the righteous, the righteous will live by his faith. Look, I, it isn't here yet. I'm standing guard. I'm watching. I'm waiting for what the Lord will say to me. And I'm longing for that day when he says, come up here. You know what I'm talking about, right? When he says, come up here. <laughs> when, he call, when he calls you up and he says, come up here to be with me for what? Come up here. He's going to say that to every born again Christian when he returns. Come up here. Man, what a day that will be. Amen? What does God put in your heart to do? Stand firm. On your post, listen for what the Lord would say to you. And whatever he puts in your heart to do, do it. You'll never go wrong by doing exactly what the Lord, and I mean this most in fact, when it's truly of God, and it's the true knowledge of him, and he speaks to you and tells you something to do, don't flick that on someone else. He spoke that to who? That's for you to do. Go do that. Amen? Why? Why? Well, it's out of love. That's what he was told to do. If you can't see that, Jesus is hanging on a cross. That's what he was told to do. And you know what he did? He did it. And now by so doing, what do we get to do? Oh, amen. We get to partake in it. We get to live forever. Amen. Faith on the faith. Go share your faith today. Go share it with somebody. And if you ain't got it, well, just listen to the sermon about five or six times. Go dig into the red words and go get it. It's out there for you to have. Amen. Come dive in the pool. Any other thoughts? Any other scriptures? Let's pray. As God puts it in your heart, please pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace again in confidence, knowing that you hear our prayer. We thank you for the word that you put into our heart. And what you would sow into us as individuals, Lord, whatever that might be. Father, we pray that you help us to lay hold of that for which you've laid hold of us. Help us to share the treasure of what you've done for us. And the witness that you give to us. And the way that you've changed our lives and the lives of others. And we pray for every born again Christian, Lord. That you would give them the same desire to want to share with others what you've done in their life and how you've changed them. Faith on the faith, Father, we pray for it. Above all things, we ask that you be exalted, that you be glorified, that you be magnified. And we're so grateful to you, Lord, for allowing us and enabling us to, provide, to, to participate in your, in your divineness. We worship you in it, and we're grateful to you for it. All glory returns back to you. And no matter what we're going through today, no matter what it is, we worship you, and we exalt you, and we praise you. And we lift you up. We thank you for your leadership here, Lord. As you just continue to lead us and help us to grow closer to you and to one another, Father. Fill your church, fill your body, Father. Allow us opportunity to share your love and open up doors for your word. Again, Lord, apart from you, we're nothing. So build the house the way you see fit, Father.
in faith. Lord, we trust you. We trust your leadership and your guidance. And again, just fill us with an absolute love for you and the things of you. And help us to pursue it with all we are. Lord, all of our prayer requests, the people, our intercessions, Lord, we're asking again, as you intercede for us, Lord, all of our prayers, we just lift up to you, both spoken and un. And we ask that you answer, and we know that you will, by faith. We trust you. We believe in you. And we know that you will answer, Lord, because you always do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.